Chapter One and Introduction of Reminiscences of Forts Sumter and Moultrie in eighteen sixty sixty one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. Reminiscences of Forts Sumter and Moultrie in eighteen sixty sixty one by Abner Doubleday. Introduction. Now that the prejudices and bitter partisan feeling of the past are subsiding, it seems a fitting time to record the facts and incidents connected with the first conflict of the rebellion. Of the eleven officers who took part in the events herein narrated, but four now survive. Before the hastening years shall have partially obliterated any circumstances from my memory, and while there is still an opportunity for conference and friendly criticism, I desire to make from letters and memoranda and documents in my possession a statement which will embody my own recollections of the turbulent days of 1860 and 1861. I am aware that later and more absorbing events have caused the earlier struggles of the war to recede in the distance, but those who were in active life at the time will not soon forget the thrill of emotion and sympathy which followed the movements of Anderson's little band when it became its duty to unfold the flag of the Union against a united South in arms. I know how difficult it is to write contemporaneous history, or even to give a bare detail of facts without wounding the susceptibilities of others. But whenever I have felt called upon to give my own opinion, I have endeavoured to do so in the spirit of Lincoln's immortal sentiment, with malice towards none, with charity for all. CHAPTER One. Fort Moultrie in 1860. The summer of 1860 found me stationed at the headquarters of the 1st United States Artillery in Fort Moultrie, South Carolina. I was captain of Company E and second in command to Brevet Colonel John L. Gardner, who was Lieutenant Colonel of the regiment. The regimental band and Captain Truman Seymour's Company H also formed part of the garrison. The other forts were unoccupied except by the ordnance sergeants in charge. Charleston, at this period, was far from being a pleasant place for a loyal man. Almost every public assemblage was tinctured with treasonable sentiments, and toasts against the flag were always warmly applauded. As early as July, there was much talk of secession, accompanied with constant drilling and threats of taking the forts as soon as a separation should occur. To the South Carolinans, Fort Moultrie was almost a sacred spot, endeared by many precious historical associations, for the ancestors of most of the principal families had fought there in the Revolutionary War behind their hastily improvised ramparts of palmetto logs, and had gained a glorious victory over the British fleet in its first attempt to enter the harbour and capture the city. The modern fort had been built nearly on the site of the ancient one. Its walls were but twelve feet thick. They were old, weak, and so full of cracks that it was quite common to see soldiers climb to the top by means of the support of these crevices afforded to their hands and feet. The constant action of the sea breeze had drifted one immense heap of sand against the shore front of the work, and another in the immediate vicinity. These sand hills dominated the parapet, and made the fort untenable. Indeed, it was originally built by the engineers as a mere sea battery, with just sufficient strength to prevent it from being taken by a coup de main. As an overpowering force of militia could always be summoned for its defence, it was supposed that no foreign army would ever attempt to besiege it. The contingency that the people of Charleston themselves might attack a fort intended for their own protection had never been anticipated. Our force was pitifully small, even for a time of peace and for mere police purposes. It consisted of sixty-one enlisted men and seven officers, together with thirteen musicians of the regimental band, whereas the work called for a war garrison of three hundred men. The first indication of actual danger came from Richmond, Virginia, in the shape of urgent inquiries as to the strength of our defences and the number of available troops in the harbour. These questions were put by a resident of that city named Edmund Ruffin, an old man, whose later years had been devoted to the formation of the disunion lodges, and who became subsequently noted for firing the first gun at Fort Sumter. His love of slavery amounted to fanaticism. When the cause of the rebellion became hopeless, he refused to survive it, and committed suicide. In the beginning of July, Robert Barnwell Rett, another ultraman in Charleston, made violent speeches to the mob, 
urging them to drive every United States official out of the state. But as many influential secessionists were enjoying the sweets of federal patronage under Buchanan, we did not anticipate any immediate disturbance. To influence his hearers still more, Rhett did not hesitate to state that Hamlin was a mulatto, and he asked if they intended to submit to a Negro vice-president. It is an interesting question to know how far at this period the Secretary of War himself was loyal. Mr. Dawson, the able editor of the historical magazine, is of opinion after a careful investigation of the facts, that Floyd at this time was true to the Union, and that he remained so until December 24th, when it was discovered that he had been advancing large sums of money from the Treasury to contractors, to pay for work which had never been commenced. To make the loss good, nearly a million of dollars was taken from the Indian Trust Fund. Finding that he would be dismissed from the Cabinet for his complicity in these transactions, and would also be indicted by the Grand Jury of the District of Columbia, he made a furious secession speech, sent in his resignation, and suddenly left for the South. Mr. Dawson founds his opinion in this case upon the statement of Fitz John Porter, who was a major on duty in the War Department at the time, and therefore apparently well qualified to judge. Floyd's actions towards us, however, were not those of a true man, and I am of opinion that his loyalty was merely assumed for the occasion. He sent seventeen thousand muskets to South Carolina, when he knew that Charleston was a hotbed of sedition, and that in all probability the arms would be used against the United States. Greeley says in his American Conflict that during these turbulent times Floyd disarmed the government by forwarding one hundred and fifteen thousand muskets in all to the Southern Confederacy. In addition to this, he sold large quantities of arms to S. B. Lamore of Savannah and other secessionists in the South, on the plea that the muskets thus disposed of did not conform to the latest army model. Just before his resignation, he continued the same policy by directing that 124 heavy guns should be shipped from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to Ship Island, Mississippi, where there was no garrison, and to Galveston, Texas. Yet this was the official upon whom we were to rely for advice and protection. This was the wolf who was to guard the fold. Our commander, Colonel Gardner, had done good service in the War of 1812 and in Mexico, but now, owing to his advanced age, was ill-fitted to weather the storm that was about to burst upon us. In politics, he was quite southern, frequently asserting that the South had been treated outrageously in the question of the territories, and defrauded of her just rights in other respects. He acquiesced, however, in the necessity of defending the fort should it be attacked but as he lived with his family outside the walls, he could not take a very active part himself. Indeed, on one occasion, when a secession meeting was held in our immediate vicinity, accompanied with many threats and noisy demonstrations, he sent word to me to assume command at once in his place. He now found himself in a peculiar position. The populace was becoming excited, and there was every probability that a collision, accidental or otherwise, might occur at any moment between the troops and the mob outside if not between the mobs and the state militia. The dilemma which confronted him was either to make a disgraceful surrender of his command, or to take the other alternative, and fight South Carolina single-handed without the aid or cooperation of the general government. He thought the difficulty might perhaps be solved by removing the garrison to Smithville, North Carolina, having received permission to do so in case the yellow fever, which had proved so disastrous the previous year, should break out again. Strange to say, some of the most ultra-papers in the southern interest in New York and Charleston ridiculed the proposed movement. They probably feared that our absence might deprive the conspirators of the prestige of an easy victory. By the middle of August, the country people began to be quite violent in their language, and made many threats of what they would do in case of Lincoln's election. While the rebellion was thus drifting onward, the North remained quiescent, utterly refusing to believe in the existence of any real danger. Yet it was publicly known that although the southern states had refused to commit themselves to secession, they were pledged not to allow South Carolina to be coerced, and this practically amounted to a powerful league against the Union, since it was a combination to prevent the enforcement of laws which bound the states together. As we were liable to be attacked at any moment, we desired to get rid of the sand hills which dominated our walls. To this end we applied to the Quartermaster General, General Joseph E. Johnston, for authority to hire citizen labourers, but he declined to accede to the request on the ground that the work did not properly appertain to his department. He was a nephew of Floyd, 
and soon went over to the enemy. With the exception of Robert E. Lee, he subsequently became the most noted of all rebel generals. We were gratified about the 1st of September at seeing some signs of life in the Secretary of War, which seemed to show that he appreciated our dangers and difficulties. He ordered First Lieutenant and Brevet Captain John G. Foster of the Engineers to repair Fort Moultrie, and put that and the other defences of Charleston Harbour in perfect order. The reason privately assigned for this was that we were drifting into complications with England and France with reference to Mexico. For one, I gave the Honourable Secretary very little credit for this proceeding, inasmuch as he had just previous to this forwarded to South Carolina the means of arming and equipping 17,000 men against the United States. I, therefore, came to the conclusion that the forts were to be made ready for active service, in order that they might be turned over in that condition to the Southern League. Two young lieutenants of engineers, G. W. Snyder and R. K. Meade, were soon sent to foster as assistants. And here it may be well to speak of the officers of our command, as they were at that period. The record of their services afterward during the rebellion would constitute a volume in itself. Colonel John L. Gardner was wounded in the war with Great Britain in 1812. He had also engaged in a war against the Florida Indians, and the war with Mexico, receiving two brevets for the battles of Cerro Gordo and Contreras. Seymour Forrester and myself had also served in Mexico as second lieutenants on our first entrance into the army, and Davis as a non-commissioned officer of an Indiana regiment. John G. Foster, severely wounded at Molino de Rey, and breveted captain, was one of the most fearless and reliable men in the service. Captain Truman Seymour, twice breveted for gallantry at Cerro Gordo and Chernbuso, was an excellent artillery officer, full of invention and resource, a lover of poetry, and an adept at music and painting. First Lieutenant Jefferson C. Davis, brave, generous, and impetuous, the boy sergeant of Buena Vista, won his first commission in the regular army by his gallantry in that action. First Lieutenant Theodore Talbot, when very young, had shared the dangers, privations, and sufferings of Fremont's party in their explorations to open a pathway across the continent. He was a cultivated man and a representative of the chivalry of Kentucky, equally ready to meet his friend at the festive board or his enemy at ten paces. Dr. S. Wiley Crawford, our assistant surgeon, entered the service after the Mexican War. He was a genial companion, studious, and full of varied information. His ambition to win a name as a soldier soon induced him to quit the ranks of the medical profession. Hall, Snyder, and Meade were recent graduates of the academy, who had never seen active service in the field. They were full of zeal, intelligence, and energy. In one respect, we were quite fortunate. The habits of the officers were good, and there was no dissipation of drunkenness in the garrison. The majority of the men, too, were old soldiers, who could be thoroughly relied upon under all circumstances. There was also one civilian with us, Mr. Edward Mowell, who was the clerk and brother-in-law to Captain Foster. His services were subsequently very valuable in many ways. Fearing that in the course of events our correspondence might be tampered with, I invented a cipher which afterwards proved to be very useful. It enabled me to communicate through my brother in New York much valuable information to Mr. Lincoln at Springfield, Preston King, Roscoe Conkling, and other leaders of public opinion in relation to our strength and resources. Situated as we were, we naturally desired to know how far Mr. Buchanan's cabinet was willing to sustain us. William H. Trescott, of South Carolina, was Assistant Secretary of State at this time, and frequently corresponded with his brother, Dr. Trescott, in Charleston. We, therefore, naturally thought the views of the latter might indirectly reflect those of the administration. The doctor was of the opinion there would be no attempt at coercion in case South Carolina seceded, but that all possible telegraphic communications would cease and a man of war would be placed outside to collect the revenue. This arrangement would leave our little force isolated and deserted, to bear the brunt of whatever might occur. In October the disunionists became more bitter, but they were not disposed to be more aggressive, as they thought Buchanan would be relied upon not to take any decisive action against them. Colonel Gardner would not at this time mount the guns, or take any precautions whatever. He alleged with reason that the work was all torn to pieces by the engineers, that it was full of debris, and that, under the circumstances, he was not responsible for anything that might happen. 
we had been promised a considerable number of recruits, but they were kept back, and we now ascertained that none would be sent until late in December, after the crisis was over. In the latter part of the month, I became quite unpopular in Charleston, partly on account of my anti-slavery sentiments, but more especially because some very offensive articles, written from that city, had appeared in the northern papers, and were attributed to me. It seems that at this very time an abolition correspondent from the New York Tribune was employed in the office of Rhett's paper, the Charleston Mercury. This man professed to be the most loud-mouthed secessionist of them all. In conversation with me afterward, he claimed to be the author of these articles referred to. In truth, these were days of extraordinary prescription for opinion's sake. I heard, with profound indignation, of the case of a poor seamstress from New York, who had been sent to jail in Charleston, simply for stating that she did not believe in the institution of slavery. On appealing to the then mayor of New York, Fernando Wood, he replied that he was rejoiced that she was in prison, and hoped she would be kept there. Towards the close of the month, the South Carolina leaders began to fear that the southern states would not join them, and were engaged in discussing the subject of a French protectorate. The Negroes overheard a great deal that was said by their masters, and in consequence became excited and troublesome, for the news flew like wildfire among them that the Massa Lincoln was coming to set them free. The enthusiasm of the moneyed men in Charleston began to cool when they reflected upon the enormous expenses involved in keeping up a standing army in an agricultural state like South Carolina. At the request of some Union men, Captain Seymour made a startling exhibit, showing the large amount required to maintain even a moderate force. It had a good effect upon the merchants, and indeed, if other southern states had not promptly sustained South Carolina, the movement must have soon collapsed from its own inherent weakness. Although the secession leaders were preparing to meet coercion, if it should come, I will do them the justice to say that they determined to commit no overt act against the Union so long as the State formed an integral part of it. They soon found, however, that the mob did not recognize these fine distinctions. It was easy to raise the storm, but once under full headway it was difficult to govern it. Independent companies and Minutemen were everywhere forming in opposition to their wishes, for these organizations from their very nature were quite unmanageable. The military commanders much preferred the state militia, because they could control it by law. A gentleman from the country, who had joined the Minutemen, came in one day to the Charleston Hotel with a huge cockade on his hat, expecting to be received with great applause, but to his astonishment he was greeted with laughter and ridicule. On the 29th of October, General Scott wrote his celebrated letter to the President, recommending the strong garrison be placed at once in all southern forts. Undoubtedly this was good advice, but as our army was widely scattered all over the west to protect the frontier settlements from the Indians, only five small companies were available for the purpose. The suggestion, therefore, had but little practical value. November had arrived. The muttering of the storm was heard all around us, and yet not one word of counsel or encouragement came from Washington. Colonel Gardner began to feel uneasy at this studied silence, and determined to place the responsibility of any disaster that might occur where it properly belonged. On the first of the month, he made a full report to his next superior officer, General Wool, at Troy, New York, to be forwarded to the Secretary of War in relation to the dangers that threaten us and to our imperfect means of defence. He notified them that our provisions would be exhausted by the 20th of the month, and that we were very deficient in ammunition and military supplies generally. The Secretary, in his answer to this communication, simply expressed his regret that he had not been informed of all this before. The sympathy was no doubt very gratifying, but being of an entirely passive nature, did not benefit us in the least. Colonel Gardner, at our solicitation, directed that the guns which had been dismounted to enable the engineers to make their repairs be remounted at once, and Seymour's company and mine soon placed them in position. It was of little use, however, to have our armament in readiness unless the approaches to the fort could be carefully watched. This it was impossible to do by the ordinary system of guard duty but I suggested a plan which enabled us to have an ample number of sentinels without exhausting the men. It was done by placing each man on guard for a single hour, between Tattoo and Ravelli, allowing him to sleep for the remainder of the night. End of chapter 1 Recording by FNH
visit www.bookranger.co.uk.